If you love true crime and dark stories, then you'll love our other podcast, Dark Side of Wikipedia, with new episodes every Monday and Tuesday. He told them that in the year prior to Bundy's move to Utah, she had discovered objects that she couldn't understand in her house and in Bundy's apartment. His items included crutches and a meat cleaver that was never used for cooking. Just search Dark Side of Wikipedia wherever you download podcasts. You know, then this guy gets rich and he has some issues with sexual addiction. Yeah, and control. And, yeah. yeah. The uh, Keith Rainier story. Dark Side of Wikipedia. Press subscribe wherever you download podcasts and don't miss a single episode. It, in some ways, it starts to make things like Jeffrey Dahmer and that look tame, not in terms of, of the brutality of what they, they performed, but in terms of the psychology and manipulation of people. Dark Side of Wikipedia. Available wherever you download podcasts. Where did a mysterious crucifix come from? And what powers does it hold? That's a question one listener asks today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. That it is. 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. We'd love to hear them. Of course, you can write it on our website at realghoststoriesonline.com. And if you'd like to have access to our massive, massive archive of ghost stories, quite literally the largest audio archive of ghost stories ever created, uh, sign up to uh, be a supporter of the show, an extra podcast person, as we call them. Sign up at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. Five bucks a month gets you access to all of that. Our bonus episodes we release every single week for you. Also get you hooked up uh, with our ebook, our audio book, advanced episodes, all commercial free. And I, I, I just recently recategorized the, uh, the years so you can now search the archive by year which is kind of nice and go all the way back to uh, 2014 when the uh, program began. It's uh, Tony and Todd on today's episode of the program. Now, this is going to be airing like March 22nd. So by then, it should be a bit warmer. But today we're <laughs> recording this on February 15th of 2021. And if most of the country remembers this time, uh, it's one of the biggest cold spells I think we've seen in quite some time. Yeah, the, the cold has definitely gripped our area here in the north in Wisconsin where I'm at. But to hear that my sister in San Antonio got six inches of snow last night. And of course, in a city like that, that shuts everything down. They don't know how to deal with it. She didn't have a snow shovel, so sure. she used some sort of garden hoe to try and make a path for her dog, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then And then you're talking about farm animals and stuff like that. And I have decided without your knowledge or you're okay that I'm going to start recording our conversations <laughs> prior to the podcast and selling those <laughs> on the side because <laughs> some of the stuff that gets said is just mind-boggling. <laughs> Bonus EPPP content is what uh, that is going to be right. exclusively through Todd. Yeah, I have like a bottable snow cows in the front of the yard right now. And uh, they, uh, they kind of resemble cows, but they kind Kind of do look like more the uh, the you know abominable snowman from uh, what the the cartoon not the cartoon the claymation was it uh, Rudolph where that was in the yeah and they they pull the, the poor thing's <laughs> teeth right and he can't eat the the bumble the bumble bounces yes. yeah exactly <clears throat> that's what I got in the front yard right now and Harper's like oh look it's it's Christmassy uh, but uh, they they should be okay it should be warming up here soon I hope if not how we... is she liking the cold and the snow um, she likes the snow she has not experienced experience the cold like this outside yet yeah. <laughs> and she's like let's go sledding let's go sledding and i said okay we'll go sledding for like 10 minutes but why only 10 minutes and then i had to explain frostbite to her and um luckily she's learning this because i'm explaining it to her not how we learned it as children <laughs> by extensive pain and the prospect of losing uh, appendages 
So I think our parents did that though, so we'd never forget. I mean, they were like, "Go play in the snow." We'd be out there too long. We'd come in. Yeah. Parts of our body would be like frost white, yeah. and then we'd be in pain. And I go out now in this kind of weather, and immediately, like within two minutes or three minutes of taking the dog out, I've got icicles in my beard. <laughs> I look like a mountain man when that happens. <laughs> it's horrible. I I remember standing out uh waiting for like the school bus and stuff <laughs> in this stuff and it was because ho- everything here when it gets this cold shuts down you know if it's like below freezing it's like well we're probably gonna have snow days i'm like for the love of god i remember going up and i would uh in the 90s have a bunch of uh hair product you know like gel and stuff in my hair when i had hair and it'd be all wet because i just took a shower and by the time you finally get to school an hour later it's you could like literally break it off because it yeah. was so frozen and they were fine with that in Wisconsin. But I think it's because everybody was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, the alcohol yeah. kept you a little bit warmer and the uh, frostbite didn't bother you so much. Though. Yeah, you should have seen our juice boxes in Wisconsin in seventh grade. It was not <laughs> what you expect. Bartles and James was the brand. <laughs> uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's go to our first letter. It says, when my daughter was in grade school in the 90s, a classmate gave her a silver crucifix on the playground. His words to her were, here, you should have this. My daughter brought the crucifix home and gave it to me. I asked her if she could return it to whoever gave it to her. She said that she could not be certain about who exactly gave it to her, except it was a boy. We kept the crucifix safe at home, and I occasionally wore it on a chain around my neck. The crucifix was rather crude, and Jesus' facial features were not very nice. One day while removing the chain from my neck, the crucifix seemed to have an energy of its own. It quickly logged itself or lodged itself under a heavy dresser in my bedroom. I tried to retrieve it right away, but I couldn't find it. Years later, I was vacuuming under the dresser with my Dyson handheld vac. It was sucked up into the canister along with dust and debris. I turned the vacuum off, walked down to the kitchen with just the clear see-through canister, and I held it up to my eye level and clearly saw the crucifix in the canister. I walked into my garage carrying the canister and I decided to dump it out on a piece of newspaper. Much to my surprise, the crucifix was not in the dumped canister contents. I carefully combed through the contents at least three times. I did not find the crucifix. This happened to me about seven years ago and to this day, the crucifix has not reappeared inside my house. I'm grateful for that. I asked a Roman Catholic priest friend about the incident. His words to me were, some articles carry a curse. You don't know exactly where that crucifix had been or who owned it before you. I did not buy this crucifix. It came to me in a very strange circumstance. I also want to mention that when I wore the crucifix, another priest friend gave it a strange look but did not say anything to me about it. I doubt that I ever asked any priest to bless the crucifix. Maybe that was why I had this happen to me. I continue to wonder to this day, who was a little boy who gave my daughter the crucifix on the playground? Why did he single her out to give it to her? Especially if they didn't really know each other. And where did the crucifix go? I honestly hope never to see it again, especially in my home, car, or anywhere else in the world. That is the only paranormal incident that's ever happened to me. What a strange one it was. That is rather bizarre Number one, that a child kind of gives that out on the playground. I know kids, you know, they give each other things, but that's a little kind of creepy. Yeah. And, then, and the, then the fact that this thing was not like a normal crucifix and apparently Jesus had some strange goings on with his face. I, it, You know, the crucifix is something very interesting to me because it, there, it always seems to help um, stop evil from happening. And I think for people like myself who... Um, kind of believe in many different religions mm-hmm. and don't have something that that's necessarily stamped down. I always wonder why a crucifix or a Catholic ritual gets rid of, um, you know, uh, does exorcisms, all that kind of stuff. I don't know if I would ever take anything, especially a religious entity or item from anybody that I didn't know. And even if I did know them, I'd probably not keep it. Yeah. It, it's an interesting thing, and I wonder the same thing, too, because I've, I've asked this question to a lot of investigators. I've asked it to demonologists of what, you know, why is it, you know, because there's obviously other cultures and other religions beyond Christianity that that right. have uh, paranormal things that happen. But from what I understand, um, it's more so about 
the 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 belief behind it. So if you were to say be using a crucifix and that's not your religion or your belief system, it likely would not have that great of effects. But if you were using whatever it may be, uh, whatever that that symbol is of of power, of peace, of of well being, you know, of positivity essentially, um, that's more so where it comes in. So I mean, in in theory, I mean, if if a, a stalk of celery is you know your thing, you could essentially use a stalk of celery, you know, and that could be almost just as powerful if it's representing that belief uh, 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 that that you hold. So it, it's interesting because I, I always I've, I've asked that so many times. It's like, well, what if you, that's not what you you know really believe in or that's, you know, you have a more you know expounded upon belief system than that. And that's right. that's that's where I've been. I was going to ask you the same question. Like, what what's your thoughts on that when it comes to objects that are used in that sort of um, setting? Uh, if if one is not, you know, they're they're not a subscriber to that. Well, and I just read some reports uh, not that long ago about an exorcism where um, the priest was using water that he thought had been blessed and it wasn't, but it was still reacting with the person they were doing the exorcism on. And somebody said, well, why is that? And the priest said, because I was using it as though it was holy water. And so it was blessed through God that way. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that kind of lends itself to what you said, where it really is a belief system. It's really having faith in whatever that is that you're using. Yeah. And just, and just going back, whether it's a crucifix or it's a, it's a little locket on a chain or I just, I, that stuff holds energy. And I just, I wouldn't, it's really hard for me to go to like a rummage sale mm -hmm. or to a flea market and buy things because you never know what you're bringing home besides that old buffet table that you bought for your your dining room. What else are you bringing into your house? Yeah, and that that's what I what I wonder about a lot, especially with items at uh, at like a uh, antique store or something like that, especially like the jewelry and things of that nature, because right. those are things that well, I mean, they don't even have to be like a wedding ring. It could just be something that somebody really liked and wore almost every day of their life, whether it's a necklace, a ring, or what have you. And I. I think objects that that stay close to us physically end up holding on to things. But with that same that same thought, I also wonder this are can clothes have that same sort of uh, energy to it? Or is it different when it's more of a, a, a like a, a, an earth material, like a metal of some sort or or a rock or a diamond, whatever it may be? Uh, I've never heard of somebody like being. Um being haunted because of a bad pair of like booties or something like that. But, but I mean, I, I would say essentially if it's an item that was beloved by the person who wore it mm -hmm. or was around it, I think that that could somehow transfer energy at some point in time. So again, I have not heard that. That's an, that's an interesting question that you bring up, but my mindset is if somebody used it, they loved it, they cared for it. It was a part of their life. Um, it's going to have some sort of, their energy left over down the road. All the more reason not to buy used underwear at garage <laughs> sales. <laughs> just just one of the reasons, yes. Just, There's so many more. But that's yeah. the biggest one right there. 855-853-4802 yeah. <laughs> uh, is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Our next story says it all started when I was little. I had to see shadow figures. I also would see a baby. As I grew older, I began to see them more and started asking my mom if she had seen anything. She'd seen the same shadow figure as me. One night I was woken up and I saw a lady at the side of my bunk bed. Where's my bell? My bell's got a... Oh, here's the bell. That, that was a bad ring. That was pathetic. There we go. Bunk there bed we go. Bell. All right. I ran to my mind, uh, to my uh, uh, room, in my mom's room and slept in her bed. That night I had a dream of a lady, the same lady I had seen at the side of my bed. In the dream, the lady was riding a bike with a baby in the orchard. I then started looking up at the history of my house and where the house used to be in the apple orchard. Also, after that night, I'd seen her in my bed every night. My dog also died recently, and she was a white poodle, and I have been seeing a little white dog-looking ghost, it seems. And her twin sister, Daisy, has been acting weird. For example, she'll look at us very cross-eyed. So when I opened the door, she sprinted to the dog's room. When I went to see what she was doing, she looked like she was playing with another dog. If you have another dog, you know what I mean. 
A lot of the time you hear footsteps upstairs, even if no one is home. I also used to see a male shadow figure. I didn't like him when I saw him. I would get an unsafe feeling. The first time I saw him, I saw him walking down the stairs with my brother and sister, and I saw him at the top of the stairs. He's tall, like really tall, wearing an outfit that kind of looks like what a chimney sweep would wear. The second and last time I saw him was when my dog had an operation and was wearing a cone. My dad was sleeping downstairs with her, and when I was going to go to sleep, I looked up and saw him standing in the doorway, and then he disappeared. I haven't seen him since. The last ghost I've seen in my house is a little boy. My little sister couldn't get to sleep and was scared of the dark, so I was sleeping in her bed, and I was just looking about the room, and I saw a boy sitting by my little sister's toy castle. He was looking at me, wearing an outfit that also looked like a chimney sweep, but what was unusual was that he wasn't a shadow figure. I could see the color of his skin, and I could even see his face. I'm going to venture to say on this one that this is an individual who's sensitive and is picking up on more things than many other are around them. You know, I was thinking the exact same thing. If I had a bell in my studio, I would have rang it for you because <laughs> as she's going on, um, I was getting that that feeling. But more so when she was talking about the dog, mm -hmm. I think that more than likely the dog's energy is there and she's able to um, interact with it, see it, notice it. But with, with everything going on, it really sounds like this person has some abilities and just in, a, in the right place at the right time on this one. Yeah, I would completely agree. You are a big animal lover. Have you ever had any uh, experiences with pets after they've passed? One time, um, I've really, in my, in, my, in my adult life, I've only had one dog that's passed away mm -hmm. and um, passed with cancer. And I remember specifically about three nights after he passed, I felt him jump up on the bed like he did on and off throughout the night. Mm -hmm. And I went down to pet him and he wasn't there, obviously, but I still felt that. So I do think at, at, at that time that I did experience his energy. Beyond that, I really haven't had any other animal experiences. Even in investigations, I don't think I've really experienced anything animal-wise, which I'm kind of surprised by. The animal thing is something I didn't, uh, I mean, I, I, I've just never really thought of it much till I started doing the show. And when I look back, I realized I had had an experience very similar to what you just described. I had a cat that died uh, when I was very young, probably like seven or eight. And uh, it would always sleep at the end of my bed. And you get that distinct feeling of the cat. It jumps on the bed. Then sometimes it does the paw thing back and forth. Yep. And you just know what that feeling is. And it died. And then for a long, long time, I would be laying in that bed and I'd feel that cat jump on the bed. The cat we got after that hated me. Um, so it would never be on the bed. But I would always think, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's Murphy, the cat at the time that would be jumping up on the bed. No, the cat's not there. The cat's in the other room. My door is closed, but I would feel it. But I never associated it as being ghostly. I always just thought it was in my head. I think it even happened even after I'd moved out. I think I was like visiting at some point in my 20s and was staying in that room. And it, I had that feeling. And I still didn't associate it. I still was like, oh, isn't that weird? The, you know, muscle memory, you kind of, you know, you feel those things. <laughs> but and there's an aspect of that that I know we all have where sometimes if the same thing goes on over and over and over, you're just going to experience it. I was like that forever, probably for at least 10 years after I moved out. Uh, I would always hear my dad going to work in the morning, the sound of the, gra the gravel right. in the driveway crunching. And I would wake up every morning at like 6.30 thinking I'm hearing this gravel and I'm in the city and there's no, that's not happening. But eventually that did fade away. But the the feeling of the animal was something that I... I look back and go, I think that was something. I think it was something ghostly. Well, especially since it went on for so long and even happened when you came back after being gone from that uh, location for so long. I wonder what would happen like now if you had a chance to go back and visit. Um, I I would I think it'd be so awesome if like it actually happened again. That would blow my mind. What I'm because Harper usually stays up in that room now, and I'm usually in a different room. But I I'm curious because I I almost like want to go and stay in it. But I'm also curious. I think it'd be even creepier if Harper's like <laughs> it felt like the cat jumped on the bed last night. But Grandma doesn't have a cat anymore. Yep. And I don't know. That could be kind of interesting. 
it's an experiment to try next time I'm uh, I'm up there. They um another uh, animal dead cat story uh cuz everybody loves dead cat stories. <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, my, uh, my last cat, my, uh, that I had had, um, my parents ended up, uh, taking it as their cat, uh, because I had moved to a place at the time that didn't have a lot of cats and, uh, stayed there, ended up passing at like the age of about 19, 20, I think. Right. And, uh, after it died, and this is an interesting one, uh, this cat would get hairballs quite a lot at night and, they swear, and my dad does not believe in ghosts. My mom does. My dad, even after having this experience, still doesn't believe. He doesn't know what it was, but he does re He does recognize that this happened. They would hear what sounded like the cat walking on like the linoleum floor in the kitchen, kind of, you know, the claws, and then the sound of the cat hacking up a hairball. Unreal. Like Unreal. The, for, the, the, la for the two weeks or so after the cat died, it would happen every other couple nights. And then it just kind of stopped. But I'm thinking, how shitty is that? You're a dead cat. And the thing, your 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 one vice or your one thing in life that you really hate between sleeping and eating is you got to hack up hairballs every now and then. And in death, you still got to hack up the damn hairballs. <laughs> or you did it so much that that energy was yeah. left behind. And that is how you're being represented <laughs> now that you're gone. All the like love and cuddling. None of that. Doesn't no. matter. <laughs> nope. Nope. It's, it's that wet ooey gooey stuff that you walk in <laughs> when you wake up in the morning and you didn't know they did it at night yeah it's like a human only being remembered for like having really bad diarrhea or something you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah he got the shits every time he went to chi chi's like well, that. i'm telling you right now i woke up last night i could smell it i know he's been gone two weeks but my god i thought he was in the bathroom you know, you know? he rescued those 42 children from that burning school and he uh, gave all of his money to charity but God damn, he could shit out those bean burritos. And that's <laughs> that's all that's remembered. 855-853-4802 uh, is our number. Let's go to a caller. Hi, you're on the air. Hey, good morning. Uh, um, this is Ivan. I called in uh, two times so far, and you aired both of my stories. I wanted to thank you for that, uh, for sharing those stories. Um, I spoke about my mom, who used to be into Santeria slash Brujeria. Um, I pretty much grew up in a normal child. Grew up in Kenner Square in uh, the rural area. And, uh, yeah, ever since I can remember, my mom was uh, definitely uh, like a conduit or a psychic of sorts. Uh, there were times we would be sitting in the living room watching the Brady Bunch or whatever it was, and all of a sudden she would just start acting weird. And then after that, my dad, he already knew what to do. He would come and sit next to her, and she would start speaking, usually in a deep voice and she would tell them things, uh, either things that were going to happen. Uh, sometimes it was lottery numbers that she would tell them to play. Uh, but usually it was a message for someone. Um, I got one that I was going to be in a car accident. My brother got one that he was going to drown. And she used to warn my dad um, of things that were going to happen. Um, as a result of her being involved in that, she used to have people that would come against her. One was my aunt that I call the witch to this day. And that's where the black magic came in. Um, you know, so I've seen some strange things. Uh, her room was set up where she had Africans, Indians, Buddhas, and uh, these other saints and other statues that she had throughout the room. Uh, when you came in her room, you would get the creeps. You felt like the statues were watching you. She would uh, light cigars for them and give them liquor and give them water. Uh, she had this big, like a vase, looked like a big wine uh, cup. And she would keep it filled up with water. And believe it or not, it was like a crystal ball to her. Uh, there were times that she would just get that, whatever it was that would come to her or through her, and she would look into it. And she would start chanting something. And the next thing you know, like I said, my dad already knew what to do. So he would be right there next to her and she would start talking to him. Uh, it kind of became the norm for us. I know I was never really afraid of when she acted like that, but I, you know, like I said, I was always afraid to go into her room. Felt like I was being watched in that room. And uh, that's pretty much how that was, you know, growing up. And, um, you know, things just kind of uh, took a turn for the worse there towards the end because they were coming against her and so then she started practicing black magic, basically. 
like I said, it's called brujeria. And I seen her one time at the table. She took a jar, regular mayonnaise jar, whatever it was. She emptied it out and she wrote something. It must have been about four or five pages long. She stuck it at the very bottom of the jar. And then she put salt, pepper, lemon, lime, everything that was salty and sour. And she poured it in there and then she took a black candle and she basically melted it down into the jar on top of the letter and on top of all the pepper and stuff and took it. She sealed it up and she buried it in the backyard next to the tree where our dog was at. Now, this was a healthy dog. He was uh, not sure exactly what kind of a dog he was, like a Labrador retriever. But he was a healthy dog, though. And there was one night on a Friday night. I remember it was about 9 o'clock in the evening. And we're all sitting in the house. And the dog started howling like like a wolf. Just kept howling and howling and howling. And I was like, what's wrong with him? You know, he never acts that way. But my dad went out there. And he brought the dog in the house. Uh, the dog came in the house, continued to howl. And within a matter of minutes, he dropped on the floor, started shaking, kicking. He spewed up all this green stuff. And then he just died right there in the living room floor. That I was freaked out about. I just, uh, I was like, wow, whatever she put in that jar, it was that strong that it killed the dog. I was, you know, that's what I thought. I'm about 11, 12 years old. So, you know, that's what came to my mind that, my mom just killed the dog with whatever it was that she buried in the next to him. And, um, you know, like I said, she didn't really die a pleasant death. But, uh, you know, I've experienced things since then. I'm not saying it's related to that. I feel like something does follow us around. I heard you and Carol speaking about it and saying how maybe I should go see someone like a psychic or a medium to see what is going on. Um, you know, maybe she needs some kind of closure or maybe she did, uh, conjure something up and left that door open. Um, I really don't get scared, but I just know that there's something there. And like I said, it's, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that we experience things from one house to the next. I don't believe that every house that you move into is haunted. Uh, the house that we're living in now was built in like 1920. You know, so I'm not saying that nobody has died in that house, and I'm pretty sure, you know, a lot of people have come through in that time. But, you know, I just think it's something that follows us around. And, uh, again, I just wanted to share that again, you know, a little more insight on my mom. We are planning on going to go see someone to see what they have to say about it. It's just a matter of finding someone that is actually real and, uh, you know, just take it from there and see what happens. Uh, keep you updated, let you know what's going on. And uh, and, I, and like I said before, and I thought uh, Carol thought it was kind of funny when I said, you know, we're not paranormal investigators, but I do believe in life after death. I do believe in the paranormal. I believe that ghosts do exist. I believe that there's good spirits, and I believe that there's bad spirits. And uh, you know, every now and then we go to places like... Uh, Gettysburg, which we're planning on going to in, in the next few weeks. We're going back again because the few times that we've been there, we've never experienced anything. Like I said, we thought we heard something one time, but I, I don't know. It could have been something else. But, uh, yeah, as my wife says, you know, I'm going to keep uh, looking for ghosts until I finally see something, and then I'm going to stop. <laughs> uh, but, again, thank you guys for airing my story. And, uh I definitely enjoy the show. Never been a podcast listener. I became an EPP member, and uh, I look forward to hearing more stories and uh, feedback. So, again, thank you very much, and have a good day. Thanks for sharing your story, and thanks for supporting the show. I think the biggest question I have there is, would it work in a Miracle Whip jar, or does it have to be mayo? <laughs> You never know with stuff like that, to be honest. I think the the best advice, I think he said Carol said it, maybe you said it, like he should see someone who has some abilities and find out what is, quote unquote, following him. Mm -hmm. um, the energy could have came through through his mother. Who knows? It could be his mother uh, it, that is trying to contact him. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting, I think, that he had a chance to see his mother 
this way, doing these things, experiencing these things while she was alive. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a situation where my mom passed away and I learned a lot of things about her after the fact. Really? So I, I never saw her as, um, what apparently she was or some of the things she did until after she passed away. And I just happened upon them when I was going through her stuff after she passed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting that he grew up with it and had all these experiences. I mean, at this point in his life, he's got to be experiencing so many things from his mother in some way, shape or form, whether, whether it was just the, um, the residual from seeing his dog die that way to watching her put something in a mayo jar and, and, uh, and burying it to, you know, any other magic that she was doing over time. I mean, it's, it's incredible what he's been through. It's weird because I can't picture your mom practicing black magic in Santeria. That's just. I, <laughs> and I don't know necessarily that it was, but there was some Catholicism going on. Okay. And also, um, you know, one of the things I found in her, not to give too much away, but one of the things I found in her closet was uh, a bunch of blessed salt. Interesting. And it, it was very interesting to me because I didn't think my mom was into that kind of stuff. But again, you learn some things after people pass and you start putting mm -hmm. two and two together. So. Did you ever share your stories with her about the, you know, your dreams and the creepy stuff that, that would kind of plague you throughout childhood and such? I, with she her? was aware that I had that. Okay. And before she passed, she knew that I was, you know, obviously a paranormal investigator and I had the, the movies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, she had an experience in her life where she lost a family member to murder. Mm -hmm. And once that happened in her life, she turned away from all of that stuff. Okay. And, and I think she changed a little bit at that point because um, she saw all of it as maybe a little bit too evil or, or a little bit too dark for her. Mm -hmm. But she and I were the ones we'd be up on a Saturday night when everybody else was gone and dad was already sleeping. We'd be watching all the scary movies at night. Yeah. And then all of a sudden something happened in her personal life and all that stopped. Interesting. It, it makes you wonder a little bit. I wonder if there was, you know, there was something that was kind of, you know, maybe bothering her you know, following her that was in the realm of paranormal that maybe she was trying to do some things to, you know, make it stop or have some peace with it, but was never telling anybody. I don't know. That's just, you know, from what you're telling me of what you were finding, that's kind of where my mind goes. My theory on it is that the individual who, um, who caused a murder in her family, mm -hmm. um, she was very unhappy about that, obviously, when it happened. And I think that she may have done some things in retaliation to him oh. um, spiritually. And I think that after he passed away, I think she may have been experiencing some things of her own. Mm. And again, like you said, doing some things to kind of protect herself, protect her family that none of us were aware of. Because, of course, my parents were from a time when you didn't talk about anything. Sure. You just every, you swept everything under the carpet and you didn't talk about it. That means it didn't happen. So. Yeah. That's so interesting. Thanks for sharing that one. That's uh, that's a new little antidote. That was mm. uh, 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 that's, that's when you find the creepy stuff. I can only imagine what I'm going to find in my parents' closet. That's uh, <laughs> that's going to actually create a whole podcast of its own. It's like, <laughs> look what we found today as we unravel that mystery for like 20 years. Uh, it's going to wrap up today's episode of the show. If you like it, keep us on the air. Become a uh, EPP Extra Podcast person at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash Stories. Until next time, for Todd, I'm Tony. Thanks for listening to Real Ghost Stories Online. <laughs>